There were walls between us. By the cross, you came and broke them down. You broke them down. There were chains around us. By your grace, we are no longer bound. No longer bound. You called me out of the grave. You called me into the light. You called my name, and then my heart came alive. Your love is greater. Your love is stronger. Your love awakens, awakens, awakens me. Your love is greater. Your love is stronger. Your love awakens, awakens, awakens me. Feel the darkness shaking. All the dead are coming back to life. I'm back to life. Hear the song awaken. All creation singing, we're alive. Cause you're alive. You call me out of the grave. You call me into the light. You call my name and then my heart came alive. Your love is greater. Your love is stronger. Your love awakens, awakens, awakens me. Your love is greater, your love is stronger, your love awakens, awakens, awakens me. And what a love we found, death can't hold us down. We shout it out, we're alive, cause you're alive. And what a love we found, death can't hold us down. Shout it out, we're alive, cause you're alive. And what a love we found, death can't hold us down. We shout it out, we're alive, cause you're alive. Love is great, love is stronger. Love awakens, awakens, awakens me. Your love is greater. Your love is stronger, your love awakens, awakens, awakens me. Your love is greater, your love is stronger, your love awakens, awakens, awakens me. Your love is greater, your love is stronger, your love awakens, awakens, awakens me. Your love awakens me. Good morning. Come on now, you got to be more awake than that. You got an extra hour of sleep. Have a seat for me a minute, will you? Uh, I saw a bunch of preachers sharing a, uh, uh, a new kind of daylight savings time meme. They all were saying, uh, get excited about tomorrow because you get an extra hour of preaching in. So, uh, no, we're not going to do an extra hour of preaching, but uh, we did get an extra hour of sleep this morning. I got here early. I looked out my window to make sure that uh, we didn't have any early birds showing up, thinking they were going to come to worship at 8. Uh, uh, they didn't. Uh, or if they did, they kept driving by because they saw the parking lot was empty and it dawned on them what was going on. So uh, let me share with you what's going on in uh, the life of the church where you can get plugged into the mission and ministry and join us in being the church that God has called us to be. And while I do that, uh, on the end of each row, you'll see a, a basket of some sort with a, a registration pew pad in there. Pew pad. We don't have pews in here. We have chairs. So a registration chair pad in there. And uh, pass those down. Make sure your neighbor gets a chance to uh, fill those out this morning. We uh, sure would appreciate that. All right, uh, announcement-wise, we've got a couple of meetings coming up this week that you'll uh, want to know about. We've got the uh, Board of Stewards meeting. Uh, is going to be tomorrow evening at 6 p.m. And a uh, nominations meeting coming up at uh, Tuesday at uh, 6 p.m. So Monday is the Board of Stewards. Nominations meeting is Tuesday. These are all uh, meetings that are going to help us get ready for our our church conference, which will take place in, in December, it's the big yearly business meeting, uh, and uh, so just to be aware of that. Uh, also, uh, we've got, uh, we're in the middle of our stewardship campaign, you're going to be hearing a little bit more about this in a little bit from uh, Diane Fritchie, 
But uh, I do want to let you know that next Sunday, uh, November the 12th, is our uh, Commitment Sunday. So hopefully you already checked your email or received it by snail mail, uh, an email from us or a letter from us talking about Commitment Sunday uh, and also giving you access to uh, a, a commitment card uh, or a, an estimate of giving card so that we can help plan our budget for uh, 2024. Uh, this is how we empower ministry and continue to reach out and do kingdom work, uh, and it really does help us when you fill those things out uh, so that we can make plans for, uh, for the new year and the ministries in, in the year ahead. So if you, uh, if you can or haven't seen that yet, be sure to check your email or check your mailbox and uh, uh, come prepared for Commitment Sunday next Sunday. Yes. Yes, next, the Commitment Sunday is a combined service in the sanctuary. Uh, we're going to have uh, uh, these guys up here that are helping us today uh, over there with us as well. So it'll be a, a combined traditional and contemporary service. And uh, afterwards, we're going to share a light soup uh, meal together over here in the Family Life Center. So if you'd like to prepare a soup uh, uh, to bring, come uh, either talk to Tammy or sign up out on the table. Uh, we certainly would appreciate you helping out with that. November Mission Barrel is we're collecting wrapping paper and gift bags for our children's ministry. They do a children's Christmas market, and they need that for that event. Uh, Potluck with a Purpose coming up on Wednesday, November the 8th. Uh, that's this Wednesday uh, in the Family Life Center here, so bring a dish to share. Uh, bingo, B-I-N-G-O, Veterans Day Bingo and Games, Saturday, November 11th in the Family Life Center at 2 p.m., Children's Ministry Bake Sale is also going to be going on during uh, our Commitment Sunday. Uh, so uh, come with a little extra cash to help the kiddos out for their, uh, their bake sale. Outreach Ministry Meeting, Harper Hall, November 13th. Uh, we've got a new Bible study starting up uh, over the Gospels that uh, Sherry Henry is starting. Uh, we've got another group going out to the East Texas Food Bank to volunteer. Uh, and then uh, we also have a blood drive coming up again. Uh, here at the church on location, November 26th. All these are in the announcement sheet that you can find out on the welcome table, so please be sure to pick one up uh, if you haven't already so that you have this information and put it on your calendar and join us for these wonderful things. All right, any other announcements? Anything I've missed? If not, then I invite you to stand and let's greet one another in the name of the Lord. There's a grace when the heart is under fire Another way when the walls are closing in And when I look at the space between Where I used to be in this reckoning I know I will never be alone There was another in the fire Standing next to me, there was another in the waters, holding back the seas. And should I ever need reminding of how I've been set free, there is a cross that bears the burden where another died for me. There is another in the fire. There's another in the fire. All my 
want dead, left for dead beneath the waters. I'm no longer a slave to my sin anymore. And should I fall in the space between what remains of me in this reckoning? Either way, I won't bow to the things of this world. I know, and I know I will never be alone. There is another in the fire standing next to me. There is another in the waters holding back the seas. And should I ever need reminding, what power set me free there is a grave that holds no body and now that power lives in me there is another in the fire oh there is another in the fire oh there is another in the fire oh I can see the light in the darkness as the darkness bows to him. I can hear the roar in the heavens as the space between we're split. I can feel the ground shake beneath us as the prison walls cave in. Nothing stands between us. Nothing stands between us. There is no other name but the name that is Jesus. He who was and still is and will be through it all. So come what may in the space between all these things unseen in this reckoning. I know I will never be alone. Yeah, I know, I know, I know. I know I will never be alone There'll be another in the fire Standing next to me There'll be another in the water Holding back the seas And should I ever need reminding How good you've been to me I'll count the joy come every battle Cause I know that's where you'll be I'll count the joy come every battle Cause I know that's where you'll be I'll count the joy come every battle Cause I know that's where you'll be There'll be another in the fire Standing next to me There'll be another in the water holding back the seas and should i ever need reminding how good you've been to me i'll count the joy come every battle because i know that's where you'll be i'll count the joy come every battle because i know that's where you'll be i'll count the joy come every battle Cause I know that's where you'll be You are here Moving in our midst I worship you I worship you. You are here, working in this place. I worship you. I worship you. You are here, moving in our midst. I worship you. Oh, I worship you. You are here, working in 
this place God I worship you oh I worship you cause you are way maker miracle worker promise keeper light in the darkness my God that is who you are you are way maker miracle worker promise keeper light in the darkness my god that is who you are you are here touching every heart i worship you i worship you you are here healing every heart i worship you oh i worship you you are here turning lives around i worship you oh i worship you you are here you are here mending every heart I worship you, yeah, God, I worship you. You are way maker, miracle worker, promise keeper, light in the darkness, my God, that is who you are. You are, you are way maker, miracle worker, promise keeper, light in the darkness. My God, that is who you are. You are way maker, miracle worker, promise keeper, light in the darkness. My God, that is who you are. You are, you are way maker, miracle worker, promise keeper, light in the darkness. My God. That is who you are, 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 and we say that is who you are, we say that is who you are. That is who you are. You are way maker, miracle worker, promise keep light in the darkness. My God, that is who you are. You are way maker, miracle worker, promise keep light in the darkness. My God, that is who you are. Even when I don't see it, you're working. Even when I don't feel it, you're working. You never stop, you never stop working. You never stop, you never stop working. Even when I don't see it, you're working. Even when I don't feel it, you're working. You never stop, you never stop working. You never stop, you never stop working. Even when I don't see it, you're working. Even when I don't feel it, you're working. You never stop, you never stop working. You never stop, you never stop working. Even when I don't see it, you're working. Even when I don't feel it, you're working. You never stop, you never stop working. You never stop, you never stop working. Waymaker, miracle worker, promise keeper, light in the darkness, my God, that is who you are. You are waymaker, miracle worker, promise keeper, light in the darkness, my God, that is who you are. You are, and you are waymaker. Miracle worker, promise keeper, light in the darkness, my God, that is who you are. You sing it. 
That is who you are, God. We can say it a thousand times in a thousand different ways, and it still wouldn't be enough. So we hope that our meager praise and our meager offering of worship, even though it's all we have to give, is pleasing to you this morning. God, as we continue today, stay in this place. Dwell here with us. We love you so much, Lord. It's in your name we pray. Amen. You may be seated for just a moment. My name is Diane Fritchie, and I've been asked to speak to you for just a minute on stewardship. Isaiah 43, 19, for I am about to do something new. When we join this church, we commit to give our prayers, our presence, our service, our witness, and our gifts. And so during this time of stewardship, we focus on gifts, which include your time and your money. As Christians, we're called to give our best to God's work. And so during this time of stewardship, we focus on giving our best, our first fruits, to God the Father. If you're visiting with us and you've been visiting for the past couple of Sundays, I know you're wondering if all we talk about is money. I want to assure you that we only do this once a year, and it's to remind all of us that we have an obligation as Christians to God with our money and our talents. For some of you, I know that money is a difficult topic, although I don't understand that, but I, I, I know that it exists. We forget that we're committed to God as a Christian, and we forget and ignore a biblical truth of tithing. When I was growing up, every time the tithing sermon came around, there was a lot of grumbling. And some of the older people said, well, God will provide. And while I know that's true, do you all remember that? I hear you laughing. I know you remember that. While that's true, I think they missed the salient point and a vital part of God will provide. You see, God created you and me. God created them through which he provides. So God has created you and me to be in this place, in this time, to give our service, our prayers, our witness, our presence, and our gifts. For I am about to do something new. Do you know what the rest of that verse says? It says, see, I have already begun. Do you not see it? So see, God has already begun the new work here at this church during this time in you. If you have never given money to the church before, I hope that you will consider starting, no matter how small, and see what God will create new through you. If you are giving, but you've never tithed, I hope that you will consider giving a little more toward the goal and see what God will create new through you. And if you are tithing, I'm going to ask you to consider targeting something over and above that and dedicate it to a special mission, to a mission that's special to your heart and help this church 
with God's work. So here at Bullard Methodist, we make it really easy for you to give. You can give each Sunday through a check like I do because otherwise I won't remember. You can mail it to the church or you can use our online tool, which is very easy to use. BullardMethodist.org and there's a little tab up at the top that says give. And if you hit that, I've done this so I know this is true. If you hit give, there's a drop down and it takes you right to the online giving. And there you will find two things. You will find a, a link that will take you to how you can give each week or ever how you desire through that um, uh, an online giving website. It will also give you a link to our online estimation form. Now why do we ask you for the estimation form? It's because if we don't have an estimate, if we don't know what your intention is, then our finance team has to guess at a budget. And while I know that all of you do not really focus on this or know that it exists, this church does operate on a budget. And I can assure you that every penny is accounted for, every penny that's spent is approved. There's an accounting given monthly, and in our monthly newsletter, you will see a high-level accounting of the dollars that are given and the spend. And if any of you would like a detailed accounting, I'm sure that that could be arranged. So please consider filling out the estimation of giving form. It is not cast in stone. We understand that life happens and sometimes you may not be able to live up to that estimate but without the estimate we don't have any way to prepare the budget for the year I also want you to know that there's no condemnation here and so if you just can't live up to the estimate no one is going to call you or catch you at the door when you come in and say hey hmm, you're under your estimate nobody's going to do that it's an estimate it's between you and God for what you can do with the resources that he's given you so as we enter this time of reflection, I respectfully ask you to open your hearts to how God is moving in you, for he is about to do something new. See, can you see it? He's already here and he's already working. Thank you. Turn there I am all right thank you so much I am for doing that she has been very helpful as a church leader and and uh, we appreciate her coming and sharing uh, with uh, with her with her heart and uh, about our stewardship campaign I do hope that you will prayerfully consider uh, what your giving will be in the, in the new year so thank you so much for that would you bow your heads as we pray Gracious Lord, may the words of my mouth and the meditation of all of our hearts be acceptable in your sight this day, O Lord, our rock and our redeemer. Amen. Amen. This time I'm going to invite you to stand and join with me in our reading of the word this morning. It comes from 1 Thessalonians chapter 2, uh, verses 9 through 13. 1 Thessalonians chapter 2, starting with verse 9, going down to verse 13, says, Surely you remember, brothers and sisters, our toil and hardship, we work night and day in order not to be a burden to anyone while, uh, anyone while we preach the gospel to you. You are witnesses, and so is God, of how holy, righteous, and blameless we were among you who believe. For you know that we dealt with each of you as a father deals with his own children, encouraging, comforting, and urging you to live lives worthy of God who calls you into the, his kingdom and glory. And we also thank God continually because when, we re, when you received the word of God, which you heard from us, you accepted it not as a human word, but as it actually is, the word of God, which is indeed at work in you who believe. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. You may be seated. There's a gentleman who was obviously bent over and in pain, uh, walking with his little cane through the sanctuary, down the hallway, making his way through the fellowship hall and into the pastor's office. And he passed by uh, several groups meeting that day, and they saw him, how hobbled he was and how bent over he was and, and how he made his way with his cane into the preacher's office. A few minutes later, he uh, made his way out, 
And uh, the man was standing upright and erect. He was walking with dignity. And he went his, on his way as if he was going back the way he came. But someone stopped him and said, Sir, sir, did the, did the preacher perform a miracle on you? You went in, bent over. You came out standing up straight. What is the difference? And he said, Oh, no, it wasn't a miracle. He just gave me a longer cane. Come on. All right, all right. I, that has nothing to do with the sermon whatsoever. But uh, I, I, I've learned I've got to I've got to tell you a joke, or else you you know you're going to tar and feather me. I think someday. So, all right, okay. In our sermon series in First Thessalonians, we're in the middle of it here, and uh, as we move through First Thessalonians, we've been looking at this whole idea, this whole concept of how uh, what does it mean to live uh, a life uh, with eternity in mind. What does it look like in the here and now? How does it shape who we are when we live in such a way that we are mindful of where we're going? We are uh, aware of where God is taking us. How does that shape how we live today? And so previously we talked about several things. We talked about living with eternity in mind, how it helps us to prioritize things today that are most important. How living with eternity in mind gives us hope and perspective in life to have the long view of things we also talked about how living with eternity in mind motivates us to live a life that is pleasing to god if we're going to be living with god in eternity we ought to be living with god here and now living in a way that pleases him living with eternity in mind helps us to be more compassionate and and forgiving of others because we want them to join us in eternity and living with eternity in mind also gives us a sense of purpose and and meaning. This isn't all there is. This isn't just, hey, we're here for a few you know, years and pfft, that's it. No, we have an eternity to look forward to. It makes things different here. It gives us more purpose and meaning here. Today, uh, we're focusing on chapter 2, a, a different part of chapter 2. We looked at the first part of chapter uh, 2 last week. This is the second part of chapter 2. And in particular, we're going to focus on two verses. We're going to focus on verse 11 and verse 12. I'm going to reread those for you real quick. Don't have to worry about them being on the screen or anything, but I want you just to kind of meditate on this for a minute. This is what it says. For you know that we dealt with each of you as a father deals with his own children, encouraging, comforting, and urging you to live lives worthy of God who calls you into his kingdom and glory. This is where Paul is talking to the the people in Thessalonica, and he's telling them, the Christians there, he said, listen, we want to encourage you. You need encouragement. We want to comfort you. You need comfort. But we also want to urge you in your lives, urge you in such a way that you continue to lead lives worthy of the gospel of Jesus Christ, worthy of God's glory in this world. And so that's what I want to talk about. I want to talk about those three things, encouraging, I want to talk about comforting, and I want to talk about urging let's go with the first one encouragement we live in a chronically negative world this isn't an acute problem for our world this is a chronic problem it's an ongoing problem negativity criticalness criticism uh tearing people down those, that's all around us all the time we have voices of discouragement all around us from media from people sometimes from even family members uh from the world around us and and in sometimes from ourselves. We're sometimes our own worst enemy. Our own, we're self-critical at times. We beat ourselves up, you know. And we, sometimes I just want to tell people, listen, put the emotional baseball bat down. You don't need to do that. We're just so discouraging sometimes of ourselves, and we hear discouragement from others. Discouragement starts early, doesn't it? Kids can be really, really mean to one another. They can be very, very discouraging to one another. Maybe it comes from not being picked on, on, a, on your team, you know, and that becomes very hurtful for you. Maybe, maybe it's being made fun of because of something you wear, or, or uh, uh, maybe it's kids, uh, just kids in general can be very discouraging to one another. I, me I remember this like it was yesterday. Uh, uh, therapy has helped. I've gotten through it. No, I'm kidding. Um, but I do remember this instance from my childhood. I remember going into first grade. Uh, we got, there were several of us that got picked to go into a, a new classroom with a new teacher, uh, and uh, it was Mrs. York was her name. And they, the school had gotten, the elementary school, Thornton at Thunderbirds Elementary School, Temple, Texas, had gotten so large they, they needed to expand some of the rooms. And back then, 
they just brought in portable buildings. So we were going to get to go out to one of the portable buildings with Mrs. York for first grade. And I remember the first day of first grade, Mom had, of course, put out my clothes for me, and, and, and she put out a brand new pair of sandals for me to wear. And, and, uh, uh, and I, I didn't think nothing of it. Mom, okay, I'll just put on these sandals. You know, I went to school. And, and we're all the kids standing out there on the front porch of those portable buildings. And sure enough, I'm the only kid wearing sandals, the only boy wearing sandals. And uh, sure enough, uh, they began to, to pick on me. And I remember going home after school that day and throwing those sandals on the ground. and saying, I ain't never wearing them things again, you know. How cruel kids can be, you know. Do you have an experience like that from childhood, something where you were discouraged in your life? We grow up, and we think that that all goes away, right? Uh, because we become adults, and we're more mature, and so we don't say discouraging words to each other, but we know that's not true. We go to work, our project wasn't good enough. At home, our spouse can be very critical of us at times, or we can be very critical of our spouse. Your in-laws tell you that you're not raising your kids right. And your kids agree with them. On social media, we see some social event that everybody else got invited to but us. Or that vacation that everybody else is going on except us. And we feel discouraged. Life in general can at times be discouraging. Former heavyweight boxer James Quick Tillis was a cowboy turned boxer from Oklahoma who fought out, uh, fought out in Chicago in the early 1980s and he still remembers his first day in the Windy City after his bus traveled from Tulsa to Chicago he says I got off the bus with two suitcase under my arm in downtown Chicago and I stopped in front of the Sears Tower I put my suitcases down I looked up at that tower and I, I congratulated myself that you know listen I'm gonna go conquer Chicago and he said I looked down and my suitcases were gone Life can be discouraging. In John 10.10, 10, Jesus tells us the thief comes to steal, kill, and destroy. And I have come that they may have life and have it to the full. Of course, the thief that he's talking about is the devil. He's talking about our enemy that's always working against us. He is the master of discouragement. John Lawrence in his book Down to Earth tells the following story. It was advertised one day that the devil was selling his tools. And anybody who wanted to come and, and, and make a bid on these tools could come first and, exp and, and, and survey the tools that had been put out on display on these tables. And so people came from far and near to see the tools of the devil. And they walked along, they noted each one of them, and, and they noted that each one of them had a name. One tool was called hatred, another envy, another jealousy. Then there was doubt and lying, and pride, and so on. But laid separate from the rest of the tools was this one particular harmless-looking tool, well-worn, but priced very, very high. What's the name of this tool, someone asked the, the, the devil. And the devil said, oh, that one's called discouragement. Why is the price so high? And the devil said, because it's more useful to me than, than the others. With it, I can pry open and get inside a person's heart when I cannot get near him with any of the other tools. And then once I get inside, I can make him or her do what I choose. It's a badly worn tool because I use it almost on everyone since few people know it belongs to me. The devil's price of discouragement was so high that tool never sold. And it's still his primary tool today. And many of us don't realize that it's him that's using it. You see, in a negative world, people need an encouraging word. Let me say that again. In a negative world, people need an encouraging word. Right up front, I want you to know something. God is calling you to be an encourager. If you're a believer in Jesus Christ, if you proclaim the good news of Jesus Christ, you are called to be an encourager for someone else. Someone else needs to hear an encouraging word from you today, this week, tomorrow, every single day. God has given you the chance, the opportunity to join him, to join Paul in being an encourager in this world. Paul encouraged the Thessalonians 
by reminding them of God's love and grace. He knew that they were facing persecution. He knew that they were facing challenges and trials. But he wanted them to know God was with them and would sustain them through the difficult times. And in the same way, we need to encourage one another today. We live in a world full of darkness and despair, but we have the hope and light of the gospel of Jesus Christ. And we must remind each other that God loves us and God has a plan for our lives. Some people just need to be reminded of that. Hey, don't give up. Don't, don't, don't look to the wind and the waves, but rather look to Jesus and walk on water with him. Keep your head above water by keeping your faith in Jesus Christ. People need that encouraging word. Don't give up. Jesus is with you. How can we encourage each other for eternity? Well, we can speak words of life and hope. We can pray for one another. We can serve one another in love. And we can celebrate one another's victories. We need to be encouragers. That's the first thing. Here's the second thing Paul talks about. Paul talks about comfort. John chapter 14 begins with Jesus comforting his disciples. He said in verse 1, Do not let your hearts be troubled. You believe in God, believe also in me. And then he goes on, Jesus goes on to, to, to speak to them first of the promise of the eternal home that he is preparing for them. In verses 2 and 3 he says, My father's house has many rooms. If it were not so, would I have not told you that I'm going there to prepare a place for you? And if I go to prepare a place for you, I will come back and I will take you with me that you may also be where I am. Jesus is encouraging his followers by talking about eternity. The second thing he goes on to say is that he speaks to them about the way to get to this new, new eternal home uh, with, that is through Jesus alone. He says, I am the way. If you want to know how to get to this eternal home that God offers us, you need to remember that I am the way, I am the truth, and I am the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. And then finally, he speaks to them of the gift they would soon receive from God, which would be with them as they wait to reach their eternal home, the indwelling of the Holy Spirit, he says in verses 6 and 7. And I will ask the Father, and he will give you another advocate to help you and to be with you forever, the Spirit of truth. Something we need to understand at this point in John's Gospel is that the disciples were beginning to become discouraged. They were beginning to become scared. They were beginning to become afraid. Jesus was talking about having to die, and they didn't really understand what that meant, you know. And he was talking about having to suffer before he died, and they, they were concerned about what was all going on. They had spent this incredible three years with Jesus in his earthly ministry. They had seen the miracles. They had heard the teaching. They had participated in the life of Christ, and they did not want it to end. But then Jesus comes in talking about impending betrayal and suffering and death, and it's all quite unsettling for them. And so what does Jesus do? Jesus comforts his disciples. He comforts his disciples. He says, do not let your hearts be troubled. You believe in God. Believe also in me. And then he points them to eternity. Don't worry. This world is not all there is. It does not get the final say. I'm going to prepare rooms for you. I'm going to prepare a place for you. We will be together in eternity. Jesus knew that his disciples was, were concerned about what he was saying, and he wanted them to be comforted. Paul also comforted the, the Christians in Thessalonica. He knew that they were struggling with various trials, and he wanted them to know that God, through the Holy Spirit, was their comforter, and that he would give them strength and, and purpose and, and peace, in the, even in the midst of their struggle in life. Paul's words of comfort reminded them that this world was not all there was for them. And that by God's grace and comfort, they too could, could make it through this world and join him in eternity. You know, we do need to comfort one another daily. We all go through difficult times. We are all going through rough spots in life. And, and we need to, to be able to be not only the hands and feet of Christ, but also the shoulders of Christ and the, the warm hugs of Christ so that maybe that shoulder is that person needs to lean on or maybe you can be the ears of christ and listen to that person in their needs or maybe you can be that hug of christ for that person that just needs a hug to be reminded that they're not alone and that that they're going to make it through these things 
We need to be of comfort to people as we remind them of the grace of God and, and the life beyond that, that we will experience. So how can we comfort one another for eternity? Well, we can listen to one another. We can offer practical advice of help and support. We can share our own testimonies about God's faithfulness in our lives. And we can pray for one another, not just for one another, but also pray with one another. Which brings us to our third uh, thing that Paul talked about. He talked about uh, encouragement. He talked about comfort. And then he finally talked about urging. Urging people to live lives uh, worthy of their calling. Early urging to live people to live lives uh, worthy of God's glory. In Romans chapter 1, verse 16, Paul proclaims boldly these words. He says, For I am not ashamed of the gospel because it is the power of God that brings salvation to everyone who believes first to the jew then to the gentile tony evans points out that during an election people make it a point to declare who they stand for they display it on bumper stickers they have yard signs uh, flags they wear hats they wear t-shirts uh, people you know where many people stand uh, when it comes to their political affiliations there are also those, however, who uh, do not either care or who are undecided, and you can't tell where they stand politically. They don't express that in any kind of a way. Sadly, though, too many Christians are similar to the latter category when it comes to Jesus. The world just doesn't know where they stand. You may or may not know where they stand politically, uh, but there's nothing that lets you know where they stand spiritually. There's simply not enough evidence to show that they stand for Jesus Christ. What about you? If you were taken to court, if being a Christian was illegal, and you were taken to court for being a Christian, would there be enough evidence to prove you were a Christian? Or to say it another way, do people know more about where you stand politically than they do about where you stand spiritually? Folks, Paul was the complete opposite of that. No, he didn't have a Jesus hat or Jesus t-shirt or Jesus yard sign or a Jesus flag. But you knew exactly where he stood for Jesus. Paul was unashamed of the gospel of Jesus Christ. He was unashamed of, of Jesus and what Jesus had done for him. And he was boldly to proclaim his love for Christ and what Christ could do in a person's life. And Paul urged the Thessalonians to live their lives worthy of God's kingdom, to not be ashamed of being a Christ follower. He knew that they were called to be holy and righteous people. He wanted them to live in a way that would bring honor to God. And we, too, need to urge one another to live holy and godly lives today. We are called to be the salt and light in the world. We are called to be witnesses for Jesus' love and grace in every relationship with every person that we come in contact with. So how do we do that? How do we urge people, uh, urge one another, but do so with eternity in mind? Well, we can challenge one another in a loving way uh, to grow in faith. We can hold one another accountable through mutual accountability with other brothers and sisters to, to, to be their accountability partners, their prayer partners uh, for their actions, so their actions then glorify God. We can pray for one another's sanctification. Don't just pray that people come to know Christ, but people to grow in Christ. And we can also be a good example for others in our own lives by living our lives as we know that we should. Paul encouraged, Paul comforted, and Paul urged the Thessalonians to live lives worthy of the kingdom of God. He did this because he loved them, and he wanted the very best for them. He wanted them to experience the fullness of of God's blessing, and he calls you and me to do the same. He calls us to be uh, Barnabases in the world. You remember Barnabas in, 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 the, in, the, in Luke? He talks about Barnabas. His name means son of encouragement. He wants us to be sons and daughters of encouragement, lifting people up, encouraging them in their faith. He calls us to be his hands, feet, ears, shoulders, he calls us to be Jesus to others, to bring comfort in the midst of their struggle. And he also calls us, calls us to urge one another, to urge one another, for the days are short, and eternity is right around the corner, to urge those to come to Christ 
and to urge one another to live for Christ so that more and more people can come to know the saving love of Jesus as we all witness for him in the world in which we live. So let us encourage, let us comfort, and let us urge one another to live lives worthy of the kingdom of God. Would you pray with me? Gracious Lord, help us to do just that. Help us not to take our faith lightly. Help us to, uh, to remember uh, what great gifts you have given us, what great blessings we re received in, in you, our Savior. And help us so to live, O oh Lord, so that we point others to Jesus. May we be intentional as we encourage. May we be intentional as we comfort. And may we be intentional as we urge. This we pray in the name of the Father and the Son. Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. We're about to participate in Holy Communion this morning. Communion is open to all who would earnestly uh, repent of their sin and seek to live in peace with God and one another. Uh, and so everyone is welcome to partake. We do it by intinction. Uh, we will hand you a piece of bread and you will dip it into a cup of grape juice. Uh, there will be uh, two stations, one here and one here. You'll all come down the center aisle as you feel led. We don't have ushers leading you or anything. You just come as you feel led. Uh, and then you can make your way around. You'll see on the end of each uh, section here, there's on the corner of the stage, there's a table with a plate on it. That's for our uh, dollar mission club. It's not required. Uh, but if you feel so led to give a dollar, uh, it's going to the St. Paul's uh, Children's Foundation, uh, a great ministry taking place up in Tyler. Uh, if you'd like to, uh, to help them, and they do work with dentists and doctors and things like that. Uh, they do great work for children in need. You're welcome to give a dollar, and we'll make sure that money go, all that money goes to them. Uh, today and during this quarter as we collect for, uh, for communion. So uh, we remember that on the night in which Christ gave himself up, he took bread and he broke it and he gave it to his disciples and said, take and eat. This is my body, which has been given for you. And when the supper was over, Jesus took the cup shared it amongst all of his disciples and said, drink from this, all of you, for this is the blood of the new covenant poured out for you and for many for the forgiveness of sins. Drink from this, all of you, in remembrance of me. And so, in remembrance of these, your mighty acts of salvation, O Lord, we give you thanks. And we ask, O Lord, that you would pour out your spirit upon this bread and upon this cup and allow it, O Lord, to be for us the body and the blood of Christ. By your spirit, O Lord, bring us together as one one in mission and ministry until all the world comes to know the saving love of Jesus Christ. This we pray in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. Will those who would be assisting this morning please come forward at this time. do have gluten free so if you do need that please just indicate and we'll make sure that you you get that come as the Lord leads you not done with what he started and he's not done until it's good so let him turn it in your favor watch him work it for your good cause he's not done with not done until it's good. So hello peace, hello joy, hello love, hello strength, hello hope to new horizons. Hello peace, hello joy, hello love, hello strength, hello hope to new 
Who in your life needs encouragement? Who in your life needs comfort? Who in your life needs loving urging? I want you to pray about that this week. And then I want you to ask God how you are to respond. And then go and respond accordingly. And the strength and the power He gives you. Let's stand and receive this benediction. Go forth in the power and strength that God gives you to be the children of God. Children who encourage others in their faith and lift people up in a world that's tearing them down. Children who comfort. Children who listen, hear, put their arm around each other, and point each other to heaven children who urge urge people to live lives at their best the life and salvation that God offers for them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit and all God's children said Amen, go in peace Fear is not my future You are Not my story, you are. Heartbreak's not my home, no, you are. Death is not the end, no, you are. Fear is not my future, you are. Sickness is not my story. Breaks not